Let's talk about the actual quality of our recordings, starting in the analog domain. We talked about this briefly before, but if you want to have a more accurate recording, at least with tape, you probably want to have wider tape, right? If you can record onto like quarter inch tape or like two inch tape, it's going to be a big difference with the overall quality at the end, uh, with the wider tape being more accurate. When you have a vinyl record, for example, and you want to get more frequency response, you cut wider grooves because the wider you go with the groove, the more low end you're able to get on that disc. Of course, you're sacrificing the amount of time you can record on that disc, but people really want their record to be loud. They want it to be full frequency. And if that's what you're going after, you need pretty wide grooves in the actual record itself. With digital, there still is that give and take that you see with like analog tape or a vinyl disc. It just ha it just comes down to um, the amount of storage that it's going to take up, the amount that the file is going to be. So with sample rate, if we look at this example, we have a 192,000 hertz sample rate on this top file. And what that's telling me is that for each second, for each second that's going through that analog to digital converter, it is going to take 192,000 snapshots of the file. So it's gonna break it up into all of those little pieces and each piece there is actually adding to the file size. So if we look at the difference in file size here between our highest quality on the right 2.2 megabits, we have 192,000 for the sample rate, 24 bit depth, and then for our low one, we have 66 kilobits in total, and then we have 8,000 for the sample rate and 16 bit. Massive difference in recording, and that just comes down to how many individual samples are being taken. So if we zoom in here, we'll actually be able to see some of these little dots popping up. And let's go to a spot like this to start. So on the bottom here at 8,000 hertz, and I actually want to zoom over to something a little louder. Here we go. At 8,000 hertz, you can actually still count these little dots that are going up and down. You can count them all the way through. On the top, you can't see them anymore. It's become more of a wavy line because we're taking that many more samples. If I zoom into a point where we can see um, one thousandth, one one thousandth of a second, which would go from, let's see if I can get this just right. If I go from one five six eight zero to one five seven eight zero, right here, that is going to be one thousandth of a second, meaning that we should be able to count eight little dots here. And on the top, we would be able to count 192. Clearly, this gets like, you know, the number gets exponentially greater each time you're zooming out. But that's the basic idea. So if we listen to the two of these, we're going to hear that the top one is a lot higher in fidelity than the bottom one. Sample rate and bit depth. And then on the bottom, sample rate and bit depth. So I'm not going to go into the reasoning or the science behind the actual number that we've settled on. Needless to say, if you're recording at anything that's at 44.1 or above, you will be able to capture the whole range of human hearing. So from 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. In a different course, we'll be going into more of the theory behind that. If you want to look it up now, it's called the Nyquist theorem, why the number 44.1 was kind of settled on. But for now, just leave it be and know that if you're working at 44.1 or 48K, you're going to get everything. When we're listening to this file down here, that's at 8,000 hertz, we're really only hearing um, a very limited range. We can only hear up to actually 4,000 hertz there. And that's why when you look at the beginning of this file and you see the S, right, most of the, um, the frequencies for an S are a lot higher than 4,000 hertz, and thus why this has really been drastically cut down. Sample rate, and if we compare it here, sample rate, I mean, a massive difference right there, and that is all having to do with the frequency response. So for bit depth, we're not going to go too deep into this right now, but basically for each and every sample that's taken, it needs to be located somewhere, right? I mean, it needs to go up or down, so we need to set some kind of like amplitude level for it. 
And with 24-bit recording, you get a whopping 16,777,216 possible options for each one of these little dots that we're going to see. So I can guarantee you that none of these are the same. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. So it could go anywhere from top to bottom here, and there are approximately 17 million options. With 16-bit recording, you have approximately 66,000 options. So from 66,000 up to 17 million. And I think just seeing the difference in number alone makes a lot of people want to go for 24-bit, but 16-bit will still be okay. And I'll explain to you why that is right now. So if we look inside of this Bitwig Studio here, this program is pretty much hardwired to work at 24-bit, uh, all right? And actually even higher than that. It's working like at 32-bit floating point. Not important for right now, but just notice here, if we look at this meter, all right, you can see that it really only is giving us indications down to minus 40, at least for playback. And if I'm setting this fader, notice how long it takes me. And actually, I won't do it that way. Notice how long it takes me to get down to minus 20. Okay, so we're at zero approximately. And it's taking me quite a bit of time to get to minus 20. So I'm more than like 50% of the way down. But then notice how long it takes me to get to minus 40 from minus 20. If I'm at minus 20 and I continue to zoom down, I get to minus 40 a heck of a lot quicker. And then if I'm going to minus 80, I get there even quicker. And then from minus 80 down to minus 120, it's just a couple of scrolls down and I get there. And so what this is telling us, first of all, is that the decibel scale isn't really linear and specifically how we hear isn't linear. But what it's also saying is that when you see somebody mixing, how often do you see a mix where somebody has a fader down here and like a fader all the way up here and something in the middle? It's very rare. Normally the faders are all kind of clustered around the same general region. And so when you have a greater bit depth, what it's giving you is a greater degree of dynamic range. So you can see that in this program, I can go all the way down to minus infinity, but I can even go down to like minus 192 decibels. The, our human hearing, we cannot hear, we don't have a dynamic range of 192 decibels. Uh, according to the people at Audacity, and I do believe this is true, our human hearing range is something in the range of 120 decibels. And so you see with 16-bit recording, we get minus 96. So that's not enough to encompass the whole range of human hearing. But unless you're recording a classical piece of music with like really extreme dynamics and you want to get just that perfect fade out to the end, it's fine to work at 16-bit recording because even 96 decibels of headroom is quite a bit. That being said, because space is really free and pretty easy to use and it's cheap, you know, you can get a huge external hard drive uh, for relatively cheap. I don't mind working at 24-bit and I kind of prefer working at 24-bit because there are some other um, features to it that I don't really want to get into and explain right now. Needless to say, I prefer the way it actually sounds. And that's really what this all comes down to. So I hope this hasn't been too confusing for you. We're covering a lot here, but it's important to understand this from the get-go when we're really getting into just the whole theory and idea of sampling.